the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Hello, and Rajbash, as Kurdish people say. I'm Janet Beale, talking to you from my home in Burlington, Vermont, in the United States. I'm the author or editor of several books concerning the life and work of my late partner, Murray Bookchin, a social theorist and energetic advocate of a free, rational, ecological, based democratic, and above all, stateless society, who died in 2006. For much of his life, Murray Murray identified as an anarchist, but late in life, as you might know, he decided he preferred the term communalist. In any case, he remained an anti-statist. I collaborated with him for his last 19 years. Full disclosure, I don't identify myself as an anti-statist anymore, but I still respect the originality and idealism of Murray's ideas. I value his work, and I believe he created the best outline for a free democratic society. I just wish human beings seemed more willing and able to fulfill it. Well, in at least one place, they do seem like they might be up to it, but we'll get to that in a minute. So where was I? So I've produced several books, but my most recent one, and the reason for this, the reason I'm talking to you today, um, it's different from the others. It's a graphic novel that I wrote and illustrated myself, mostly during the first year and a half of the pandemic shutdown. I'm excited to talk to you about it today. It's just been published by PM Press, and it's called Their Blood Got Mixed. What's it about? Well, it's actually more a graphic memoir than a graphic novel. It's about a journey I made in the spring of 2019. Two independent English filmmakers had invited me to travel with them to a part of Syria not controlled by the Assad regime, the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, often just called Rojava. Many interesting things are happening there, some of them influenced by by Murray's writings. The two filmmakers, Danny Mitchell and Ross Damoni, proposed to me that we travel around the region and they would film me while I interviewed people, searching for traces of Murray's influence. I told them I would love to, but I didn't want the film to be personal only. After all, an astounding social revolution was underway there, one that was underreported around the world, insufficiently understood and recognized. And it would be my responsibility to witness and report on it even while I was looking for traces of Murray. The film would have to contribute to telling the story of Rojava itself, and what made that even more urgent was that Rojava's very existence was at that time threatened. The Turkish state might attack at any time, it was clear. Since the revolution was led by Kurds, and the fact of Kurds living in freedom, enjoying human rights, advancing their culture, all that was intolerable to Turkey let alone Kurds building a cutting-edge revolutionary society that was and is in so many ways the opposite of Erdogan's Turkish tyranny. Danny and Ross agreed, so we set out to explore the revolutionary society as of April 2019. So if you need an explanation of what Rojava is, um, I'll give one briefly. In 2011, the Syrian civil war began when some elements of society rose up against the Assad dictatorship. The rebellion was quickly taken over by jihadists, so the civil war that developed was basically between the dictator and the jihadists. Kurdish people and others living in the Northeast thought really that that choice was no choice at all. They wanted to go their own way to pursue pursue what they called a third way. Fortunately for them, in the summer of 2012, dictator Assad needed to pull his forces out of the Northeast to fight the rebels in the south. So that left a military vacuum, but also a political vacuum. So even as the dueling tyrannies were clashing in the south, 
the Kurds, Arabs, Assyrians, and others who lived, who lived in the north chose to follow a democratic model, one that would be grounded in women's equality with men, and in a part of the world notable for ethnic and religious intolerance, they would consciously and deliberately break with that track record and actively embrace diversity and pluralism. What made them so enlightened? Well, around 2000, Abdullah Öcalan, head of the PKK, and I must say Turkey's public enemy number one, had been arrested and sentenced to life in a Turkish prison. While behind bars, he's still there today, he realized that the Kurdish movement had come to a crossroads. Kurds were being persecuted in the Middle Eastern countries where they lived, but they were unlikely ever to achieve an independent state of their own, and Marxist revolutionism no longer seemed very relevant. Öcalan realized that the aims and principles of the Kurdish freedom movement needed to be rethought, and he was the one to do it. So while in prison, he read a lot of books on social theory from all over the world. Among many others, he read Murray's books in Turkish translation, and including his ideas about a bottom-up democratic society. That, he thought, could be a solution to the Kurdish dilemma. Rather than aiming for the elusive independent state, Kurds could aim to create their own democratic autonomous polities within the borders of existing nation states. He called this new program democratic confederalism. So that was in place in 2012, and that's the program that Kurds in Syria set out to fulfill that year. While the forces of the dictator and the jihadists were busy killing each other to the south, Kurds and their Arab and Assyrian allies established a self-governing polity in the north that was not only democratic, but multi-ethnic, one where women were not only permitted but encouraged to, permit, to participate in all social roles alongside men, including political and military roles. I actually visited in 2014 and 2015 as a member of delegations to observe and witness and report back. I was struck by the people's rapid embrace of self-governing politics, by their commitment to inclusivity, the, re the rejection of ethnic revenge, and the passion with which women embraced their new freedom and organized themselves and other women to ensure it. To build the new society, the people of Rojava wanted, above all, to live in peace with their neighbors. But this experiment in freedom in the Middle East faced immediate and unrelenting hostility from Turkey just to the north. And a little while later, it faced invasion by ISIS. In 2014, that summer, ISIS began attacking cities and villages in Iraq and Syria, overrunning them, imposing the theocratic, tyrannical, femicidal rule on them. Most people fled in terror, so ISIS achieved many victories very fast. But then, in September, ISIS attacked Kobani, the mostly Kurdish city in Rojava. There, the people's militia, well, I should say a mostly Kurdish city in Rojava. There, the people's militias of Rojava, the YPG and YPJ, instead of fleeing like everyone else, stood their ground. Turkey enabled the ISIS attack and siege of Kobani, but the people resisted. Some outside countries, seeing the valiant resistance, formed an international coalition to assist them militarily. So while the YPG and YPJ fought on the ground, the international coalition coordinated airstrikes with them. They fought neighborhood by neighborhood and freed Kobani within a few months. Then, united in the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF, with other groups, they went on to fight back against ISIS in all of Syria. With stunning heroism, they retook village after village, city after city. Finally, in March 2019, the SDF captured ISIS's last territory in Syria. It was incredible. At that moment, March 2019, when ISIS was vanquished in Syria, that was the moment when the two filmmakers invited me to go to Rojava to make the movie. So it had all it had all just 
come to an end, the, the whole war effort, or, well, or at least come to, that phase of it had come to an end because there were still sleeper cells. For a month, we traveled around and interviewed people about how the revolution had progressed and especially about the effects of the war on the society. I, was, I personally was especially eager to find out what had happened to the commitment to the ethnic and gender ideals. So over the course of a month, I interviewed women about their fight for equality. I interviewed men about how they felt about women being empowered. I interviewed a YPJ commander and a YPG commander about the war against ISIS, as well as rank-and-file members of those forces. I interviewed coordinators of the women's umbrella organization Congress Star. I interviewed members of women's economic cooperatives about their work. I witnessed a class for Arab women in Raqqa about women's empowerment. I interviewed members of an Arab village about life under ISIS rule. I interviewed families who had been traumatized by ISIS's murder of their loved ones. I interviewed refugees from Afrin traumatized by Turkey's invasion of their canton. I interviewed people in the streets of Kobani about their fears of a Turkish invasion. And much more, especially I'm, I, in, I looked at every level of the democratic society, from communes to neighborhood councils to city councils, all the way up to the, um, to the autonomous administration, the, um, the, um, the, um, the fixers that I had was, were very helpful in organizing that, so I got a good overview of the democratic self-organization. My conclusion was that while the war against ISIS had required huge sacrifices of the population that lost at least 11,000 people, it, the war had not damaged the extraordinary revolution in North and East Syria. On the contrary, it reinforced social solidarity and welded together the multi-ethnic gender-liberated society. As one man in Kobani told me, as a result of the war, our blood got mixed. Hence the title of my graphic novel. It's an expression of optimism and hope. So I need to say I didn't originally set out to write a graphic novel when I went there. But I realized, even though we were in the middle of making a film, that I also needed to, to I was having just a, a remarkable experience, having access to people at so many different levels of the society, in so many different areas of the society, that I really needed to share it in a, a personal way alongside the film. And the filmmakers agreed to that. So uh, as soon as I got home, I started working on the graphic novel. Um, so the book is... I have to say it's a slice of life at that particular moment in the history of the revolution. Much has happened since then. In October 2019, a few months after my visit, the long-feared invasion commenced when Turkish-backed jihadist mercenaries attacked Rojava and overran parts of it. While international agreements put a stop to the overt invasion, Turkey has continued to attack Rojava ever since, especially using drones. I have to say, during the Cold War, Turkey too, uh, too often fell between the cracks as international polariz polarization obscured atrocities committed by a country just in between. And just as during the Cold War, so now, Turkish, I think Erdogan has taken advantage of the West's myopia to carry on a slow-moving war of attrition against Kurds in Turkey and, now, and in Syria. While my book describes a moment in time, the problem of Turkish aggress aggression has only worsened. In recent months, as Russia invaded Ukraine, the world's attention has once again been focused on the east-west cleavage, and once again, Turkey falls between the cracks and benefits. But there are some striking similarities between the behavior of the dictator Erdogan and the behavior of the dictator Putin. Putin dreamed of reviving the imperial era of Peter the Great or of Stalin with himself in total control. Erdogan dreams of reviving the Ottoman Empire with himself as sult sultan. Putin was uniquely obsessed with Ukraine and long wanted to attack it. Erdogan is uniquely obsessed with Rojava with its Kurds and long wanted to attack it. Ukraine never threatened Russia only wanted to live in peace with its much larger neighbor. Rojava never threatened Turkey and only wanted to live in peace with its much larger neighbor. 
Putin manufactured a spurious pretext to invade Ukraine, calling Ukrainians Nazis. Erdogan manufactures a spurious pretext to, uh, to justify attacks on Rojava, calling Kurds terrorists. Both Russia and Turkey inflict genocidally brutal attacks on their respective enemy of choice. But in the face of such brutality, the people of Rojava and the people of Ukraine both have waged Im an improbable resistance, both defied expectations, and both rightly say that they are fighting in defense of values that the rest of the world holds dear. The similarities, I think the similarities between the Ukrainian resistance and, the, and Rojava's resistance are very striking. There's just one big difference. The world has mobilized to assist the Ukrainians in their struggle as well they shouldn't, I wouldn't, and I would not have wanted the world to do anything less to help the Ukrainians. But for Rojava, in its fight against ISIS, the world helped briefly, and it, with that international coalition. But then the U.S. under Trump actually gave Erdogan the green light to invade. And today, today the Turkey's attacks on Rojava and its criminalization of Kurdish politicians within Turkey all go, go unremarked in the mainstream press. I don't begrudge, again, I have to say this, I don't begrudge the Ukrainians the assistance they're getting. They deserve all of it and more. But I do wish, as well, the world would give equal consideration to the equally heroic fighters of Rojava. So I think I'll stop there, and I hope that you will, if you, if I've interested you in, in this subject, I hope you'll take a look. Um, check out my book. It's available at your favorite bookstore, either online or bricks and mortar. And I want to thank Matt for inviting me to talk to you today on this podcast. And please contact me. I'm on Facebook if you want to contact me with any questions. Thanks very much for your attention. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.